Good morning, Providence. It's such an honor and a privilege to stand before you today. And I'm so excited to be in the house of God. Um, like that song said, God keeps running after us, keeps chasing after us. God is always, um, ha has his arms open wide for us to always come back again and again. And that feels so good. That's my testimony. God never leaves me, never forsakes me. And so that always gets my spirit stirred thinking about that. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, I just come before you thanking you for who you are. God, I thank you that you're so good to your children. Thank you, God, for how much you love us, how much you care about us, how much you are concerned about our well-being. God, the things that we talk about out loud, the things that we share with our friends, even the things that we never utter, the things that we never say, you care and are concerned. I thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that is dwelling within us that is always abiding and walking with us in this life and never leaves us alone. Thank you, God, that you soften our hearts to hear from you, soften our hearts to receive from you, soften our hearts, God, so that we receive a word from you that lasts, that as we go through the week, it comes to our remembrance and we're reminded that we have power in you, that it's not by might and, and not by our own strength, God, but it's by your spirit that we live and move and have our being. God, I just thank you for who you are, for the things that you've already done and the things that you're going to do. God, I don't have to welcome you in because you're already here. I don't have to invite you in because you were already invited. I don't have to beg, part, or plead for your presence because it is here. So God, I acknowledge you and I tell you, thank you, God. I tell you, thank you, God. I tell you, thank you, God. And I give your name the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I come before you sharing a word titled, The Power is in You. As read by my husband earlier, Romans 8, 11 says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. You are not a weak Christian. You are not feeble. You are not easily broken. You are not wounded beyond repair. You are not little. You are not small. You are not powerless. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And there is power in receiving this fact. Have you ever stopped and ingested this thought that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is inside of you? I remember when this scripture was first illuminated in my spirit. I was about 19 years old and my mom had kind of tricked me into going to Bible college before going to Georgia State to finish my um, bachelor's degree. And she said, just give God one year. Just sacrifice one little year, it's gonna go by so quick, and you'll be happy you did it, and it'll be great, you can stay at home another year. And I'm like, girl, I don't wanna stay here with you another year. I'm trying to go, be free, get out of this house. My parents have five children. I'm like, I'm trying to get away from y'all. And she said, just, just give God a year. And I remember sitting in my class, and the teacher was teaching on this particular verse, and all of a sudden, all I could see was Jesus, his body in the tomb. And I said, hmm, I can, I can see his body laying there. His, his, at, in the tomb, he's still dead. So I'm like, I can see his body there. And then I envisioned this force going through his veins, right? And then I, I imagined him taking a gasp of air. And then his eyes opening and the spirit of God rising up and him waking up and standing up in power and authority. And I said, I got the Holy Ghost. I hear God talking to me. I feel God's presence when I'm in worship. But that same spirit that rose him up is in me. I was shocked. And that wasn't the first time that I heard that verse, but that day it did something to me. And my mama was right. I needed that year because it changed my life. And almost eight years later, when she tricked me again to go to seminary, it was the best decision I ever made. 
Because not only did I need that, but I also met my husband. I wouldn't be married if I didn't go. So that was, she, she got me good. <laughs> but when I think about that scripture and what it does in the life of a believer, we are reminded that we don't go through life with life knocking us around. So many times we face situations and we feel so small in the face of the giants of our life. But that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. When Paul, the writer of this Romans text, felt called to elevate the new believers to their new identity, in the beginning of Romans in chapter 1, Paul, he explains how he feels called to the Greeks and the Gentiles to tell them about this gospel that he's so excited about. He's eager to travel and preach because he tells us in this chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It had transformed his life. And it also empowered him in a new way. He declared, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Paul was inclined to not only give the church a new power-filled identity, but he also painted a picture through this book of what they were supposed to look like as Christians. When we get to Romans 8, we realize that Paul is explaining to the readers that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set us free from the law of sin and death. What the law was powerless to do. Because it was weakened by the flesh, God accomplished by sending his son. The righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled in us who don't live according to the flesh but according to God's spirit. And that's Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 1 through 4. And then he lets us know that if we don't live by the spirit, we can't please God. But we have the spirit and have the opportunity to show that we are children of God by operating in that spirit. So then I asked myself, well, why was it so important for Paul to talk about the spirit in this way? Well, for the Jews, their religious journey was one filled with following the law and living a life that was heavily focused on works. Understanding the gift of the Spirit freed them from a life of works. Their identity was no longer trapped in adhering to rules and regulations. They could serve God without religious bondage and barriers. This freedom would empower them to live a life more focused on God. It was God-centered instead of self-focused and self-centered. They were able to serve God from a place of liberation and not from a place of condemnation. This understanding can be life-changing for us all. How much better would you feel in your Christian walk if you focus on the spirit within and not your faults and your shortcomings? How much more loving and patient with others, would we all be when we allow the spirit to move through us instead of operating in our flesh? Because that's the easy thing to do. Think about how fearless we could all be if we spent more time dwelling on the attributes of the spirit instead of on what we lack. As I was studying and reading about this particular chapter, I saw that there had been some scholarly um, research done in this particular chapter, or this, this particular book of Romans. And what they talked about was this idea that you can look at it being divided into four parts. Part one is Romans chapter one through four, and it revealed God's righteousness and how we could never measure up to God's law. That's why we need a savior. And then when we get to uh, Romans chapter five through eight, it details, details this idea of a new humanity. This new humanity is one reconciled back to God through Christ. It is a new humanity that, that humanity that pleases God through belief in Christ and not through works. Part three contains chapters nine through 11, and it describes how the new humanity fulfills God's promise. And finally, part four includes Romans chapter 12 through six, which details how that promise being fulfilled unifies God's church. Romans chapter 8 verse 11 falls within the section 2 that describes God's new humanity. This new humanity is one that has accepted Christ 
and is reinvigorated by his life-giving spirit. This new humanity is one that understands that what is true about Christ is true about us. For example, is Christ loved by God? Yes. Then so am I. Is Christ afraid of the future? Is Christ burdened by fear? Is Christ burdened by shame? Then neither am I, and neither are you. Jesus is the head of this new humanity, and it is one that is no longer oppressed by the fall of Adam, but free to live justified in Christ. Paul wanted these Christians to understand that they are leaving their fallen Adam-like state to come into a new Jesus-enhanced state of being. They don't have to kill themselves trying to fulfill God's law and do it in their own strength. And we learn through his writings that we don't have to perfect ourselves with our own strength, but we're perfected through God's spirit in us. Because the wrath of God was satisfied in Christ's death. We can operate from a place of confidence, walking in God's spirit. We are encouraged to go forth full of grace and God's power as examples of this new humanity. So like the title of the sermon says, the power is in you. I love this because it assures me that I have supernatural help in whatever I face in this life. I have a friend who always says, you got the supernatural advantage. And in that reminder, when we think about how we go through the world, we don't have to live like everybody else. We have an edge. We have a spirit within us who knows all things. When I need help solving a problem, when I need help answering life's hard questions, if I need peace, if I need a new open door in my life, I can tap into the flow of the spirit within and I have everything that I need. This is your reminder that the power isn't you. You don't have to search elsewhere for the answer that you need and you don't have to search for the help you desire. You don't have to outsource. You've already got what you're looking for. In Romans 8 and 11, the word spirit is pneuma in the Greek. Pneuma means the breath or wind of God. When Paul stated the breath or wind of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you, he allowed us to see that something greater is on the inside of those of us who believe. It quickens us, it elevates us, and it makes us come alive. Now I want you to take a moment and think back to a time in your life where you knew it was only the wind of God that turned that situ situation around. We all have those moments. When did God heal or deliver you and you didn't know how or when it was gonna happen? When I think about having the breath of the wind of God within me, I can't help but think about losing my doubt and rising in faith. I've had many moments throughout my life where I had to thank God for his breath and his wind that carried me. Even a, it, most recent as in the last two years after the pandemic, I noticed I had a, an extreme overwhelming anxiety. And I kept thinking to myself, you are a very strong individual. Where is this coming from? I was kind of shook. I'm like, I don't deal with stuff like that. How does something invisible affect my body where I don't want to get out of bed? I don't want to go outside, I have weird phobias. I'm like, that ain't me. So I was really confused, you know, and my father's here. He can attest, you know, as a child, I was kind of wild. You know, I'm a little kid that you talking about jumping off of cliffs and doing crazy stuff. That was me. I didn't have a lot of fear. <laughs> you know? So I'm looking at myself in the mirror like, who is this person? I don't know her. And so I remember thinking, I have the spirit. I have everything I need in this Bible. I'm going to hide in this to figure out how I can get out of this place. And so I remember for days, for weeks, for months, I'm just sitting with the Lord. I'm praying and I'm not begging and asking, God, can you please get me out of this? Lord, what you're going to do? I'm declaring the word of God every day. I'm listening to sermons that reiterate that thought in my mind. 
Listen, the music, the only preach what I wanted to believe at that time. And so I said, God, I, I need your win. I need that refreshing in my spirit because this thing is, is trying to make me believe something other than what I really am. And who I am is what your word says. I'm filled of your power and authority. That life given forth forces in me. So I shouldn't be walking around afraid, jumping every time I see something, you know, worried. My body's feeling like it's alarms going off all the time. That's not my portion. And so when I thought about that time of my life, I said, that might not be your testimony, but you have your own of something that you said, what is this boulder that I feel like I can't move? God, I prayed the little pebbles out the way and they were able to go. And I prayed the medium sized rocks, but these boulders, Lord, I don't know how I'm gonna get it, but you can't do it in your own strength. And that's when you need the spirit. That's the only thing that's gonna get it moved out of the way. And so that breath of God is so refreshing when you're able to sit with God and say, you can restore, you can heal, you can deliver. I want to read this Romans 8, 11 out of the message version to you. And the message ver version explains it in such a beautiful way. And it starts with, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience in the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. Yeah. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, He'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With the spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as it is in Christ. Yesterday when I was reviewing this message and I was talking to Rick about it, and he said, Remind everybody, while we're sitting here together, are you breathing without thinking about it? <laughs> Have you had to stop one second and say, let me breathe. You've been breathing in and out without even a thought. Who gave you that breath? And you haven't had to worry about it. And so when we're walking in the spirit, and I love this imagery that I've heard before, you never walk around here and uh, the plants say, I'm a leaf, look at me. <laughs> you never walk past a tree and it's saying, I'm a tree, pay attention. You don't hear the wind blowing, do you feel me? It does it and you know it's there. So sometimes we strive so hard to say, God, your spirit is here. And we don't just acknowledge that it's within us. You're moving and working even when I don't see it sometimes, even when I don't feel it. You're there. If I just sit, close my eyes and acknowledge it and, and, and say, God, thank you that you're moving on my behalf. Thank you that you give your presence to us all. Thank you that it, it's not something that I have to fight and say that person has it and I gotta be mad at them because they got it. You give it to us all. Just like you give us all the ability to breathe. God, we thank you. That is that simple. It's that easy. All I have to do is come to the awareness of it. But how often do we sit and allow it to permeate through us? I want to close with this story. Last week, Pastor shared his sports story, so I thought I'd share mine. I'm the worst sports player probably out there in regards to, you know, when I'm growing up, I did pageants and all kind of little dainty things and you know, but my dad had this little rule that he played all the sports. He was talented in sports. He said, all of my kids, and I, as I told you earlier, my parents have five kids. He said, all of my kids are gonna play one sport once in their life. You need to learn team spirit. You need to learn how to be disciplined. There's some things you need to get out of being a, on a sports team. So I was like, hmm, what do I wanna play? I had done t-ball before, but I was like, what am I gonna play? And I said, okay, let's, let's try softball, dad. So I get out there and I remember my first practice, they're teaching us how to throw the ball. Mind you, I didn't even have the right workout clothes. I'm like maybe 11 or something at the time, 12, I don't know. And I find these bright purple cheetah print 
pants and I got a purple shirt with sparkle on it, you know, and everybody's looking at me like, we know this girl can't play. And my first practice, they're teaching us how to throw the ball and I hit the coach in the back of the head so hard. That man was so mad, <laughs> he was so upset. He was so mad. And so every day my dad said, you gotta get out here and practice with me. And I'm like, I don't wanna practice that. Yesterday I got too dirty. Mom just did my hair. I'm not gonna sweat it out. You know, I'm just like, and he's like, this, you gotta do it every day. You gotta get out there every day. So fortunately for me, I didn't have to play that good because my team was amazing. And we made it to the championship with me being in the outfield, me being the last hitter, it was terrible. But I was having the time of my life. I led all the cheers, led all the snack lines, you know, all the stuff that was good. My spirit of encouragement, you know, that was my lane. So we get to the last game of the year and being, you know, when you're a bad player, they make you bat last. So my dad takes me to the side, he's like, yeah, focus on the ball. You know, all you gotta do is look at it, keep your eye on it, hit it down the middle, you won't fail. I'm like, dad, I don't know. Mom told me don't get hit by the ball. Don't come back home bruised. He's like, oh my goodness, girl, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta get dirty sometimes. Like if you don't get out there and play. So I'm like, all right. So we, we're in the last inning of the game. Y'all, this is the do or die moment. Do you understand me? I'm the one that we're going to make or break it. We're going to lose or win it. I'm like, God, why is this depending on me? <laughs> so I get out there to the batter's area. And I'm just remembering what my dad said. And I'm like, all right, keep your eye on the ball. Just swing and hit down the middle. I've never done this before really well all season. But today is going to be the day. So I'm thinking to myself, God, help me. I'm praying. I was a praying little kid. I'm like, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. So I get out there, they throw the first ball, I miss. Throw the second one, I miss. The third one, I said, Holy Ghost, you gotta do something because I can't be the one to lose this game. I tell you not. I hit that ball down the middle, went over the fence. I ran first base, second base, third base. We won that little game. And I said, Lord, you did it again because that was not by my might, not by my power, not by my spirit. And I love that story because when I think back to that time where my dad was trying to train me up, I learned some of the best lessons of my life playing. And after that, I got a little coordination and I do play sports a lot better now. But I think about how it was in his DNA to play really well. Didn't mean I wasn't capable, I had never done it. It was in his spirit, his words, his word was the breath that was behind me that helped me to hit that ball. It was his words that reminded me of who I was. My kids can play. He's like, get out there, I play four or five different sports. You gotta be able to do something. And every, on everybody's mind wasn't, she's the worst player after that day. It was, that's the girl that won the game. And so when I think about this idea, of you having the spirit behind you, of you having that power and authority of God within you, you're going to win that game. Why? Because you have someone greater. You have a spirit that is greater. You have an authority that is greater. And you won't fail. So as I started with the affirmation in the beginning, you're not a weak Christian. You're not feeble. You're not easily broken. You're not broken beyond, beyond repair. You're not someone that can't be healed, that can't walk in God's power and authority. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you because you have God's spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.